The program you are about to see presents biblical truths you may have never heard before. We at Discover the Truth do our best to provide the most Bible-based and factual information possible as we uncover centuries of erroneous, man-made traditions and beliefs. Our goal is to get back to the pure, first-century teachings of our Savior and the Apostles. The information offered here is easily proved in your Bible. Don't just take our word for it. We encourage you to research what is presented. We believe you will be amazed at what you'll discover. From the time of the Messiah to our modern technological age, much Bible truth has been lost. With the melding of foreign philosophies and teachings unknown to the believers of the first century, the early church began a transformation away from its Hebrew origins. The question we need to ask ourselves is, just how far did it go? Join us for the next half hour as we take you on an incredible journey of biblical understanding as we uncover the foundation of the Christian faith. Are you ready to discover the truth? Welcome to Discover the Truth. Today we come to the crux of the question we introduced last time, who exactly were the original New Testament believers and what did they believe in practice? Were they Greeks from Athens or Romans from Rome or were they Jews from Jerusalem and surrounding areas? You know, the answer to that question should also answer the question, how different can worship today be from its roots? What changed, if anything? And if it did change, who exactly changed it? You know, these questions will lead us to a whole new understanding about what is proper and mandated for our biblical walk today. Most people have been brought up thinking that the Old Testament was only for Jews, while the New Testament is a Christian work written exclusively by Christians for Christians. Most people believe that it was the Savior who came to earth to make major changes in worship and to overhaul the, the Old Testament teachings of obedience and make them simply love and grace. Well, in addition, they have been taught that by his resurrection, he changed the day of worship from uh, the weekly Sabbath to the first day of the week, that uh, they had been led to believe he transformed the Passover into Easter, that he eliminated the law and any need to obey it. Basically, he transformed worship entirely. And they're convinced that he invented Christianity, which by definition must throw out the Old Testament if it's going to keep its New Testament identity. Well, friends, these are fundamental flaws in popular understanding because he did none of it. And we challenge you to prove it for yourself from the scriptures themselves. You know, for one thing, he commanded us not to ignore it, but to purposely go to the Old Testament and study its message. In John chapter 5, verse 39, he commands his followers to Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Well, now the scriptures he refers to were the Old Testament scriptures, which was the only Bible that existed during his walk on earth. Even the Old Testament testifies about him, he said, just as do the New Testament scriptures. So to prove the New Testament, we go to the Old Testament. In verse 47, he says that if we do not believe the writings of Moses, then how shall we believe Yahshua, the Messiah's words? Fascinating, interesting way to put that. You know, if we don't believe what Moses wrote, that is, remember he wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, then we can't believe what our Savior said. So you see how he ties the two very closely together. You know, it's time to set aside some preconceived, preconditioned notions and centuries-old inventions created by those with, happen to have deep-seated biases. 
It's time to just clear your mind of what you always thought and simply take an honest look, a sincere look for yourself. Look into the scriptures and prove whether what we are saying is true or not. While we're at this point, I'd like to introduce a fascinating booklet that we uh, offer today called Astonishing Bible Truths That Your Church Never Taught. And you can write for this, it's free of charge. The address will be given a little later on in the program. Fascinating information that uh, you probably were never aware of. And we notice here in, in part of this in Acts 17 verse 11 that the noble Bereans were, uh, when they received this understanding, they checked it out. It said they received the word with all readiness of mind, but they searched the scriptures whether those things were so. They didn't just accept it because somebody said it. They went to the Bible, and the Bible they went to uh, was the Old Testament scriptures. But anyway, we invite you to write in for this. Uh, it's called Astonishing Bible Truths That Your Church Never Taught. We think you'll find it very eye-opening. Well, here are some eye-opening facts, life-changing facts to check out in your own Bible. Fact number one, Yahshua the Messiah, your Savior and mine, was a law-observing Jew. Now, that's not something most people think about when they think of their Savior, because they've been given uh, a, an introduction of him in a more or less a Greek context, and they're not attuned to thinking about him as a Hebrew. Well, fascinating, a recent Time Magazine article listed the top 10 ideas that are changing the world. And they, they, they mention on here that uh, the revolutions are happening all around us. They mention revolutions in the environment, the economy, technology, and religion. And on uh, page 60 of this, this uh, magazine, they, in an article titled, The Rejudaizing of Jesus, they point out that the religious world is waking up to the fact that the Christian Savior was a Jew who taught from a Hebraic context. Here again, you've got to reorient your thinking and step out of the, uh, the, the mold, so to speak, and think about these things. The Time Magazine writer says this fact is, uh, it, its impact on the religious world, he says, is, quote, seismic, end quote. He asks, what does this mean practically? What does it mean that our Savior was Hebraic and the writings of the New Testament are Hebraic? And then he answers uh, by the fact that knowing the New Testament's Hebrew roots solves many difficult issues in the New Testament. He calls it a trickier revision to understand that the book of Romans is Hebraic in context and no longer really about Gentile Christians. This truth presents some new challenges, however, he says. The writer wonders, how do you teach this absolute fact with most people not accustomed to thinking this way? He ends the article by saying, once you understand, you're in deep. You're hooked because you can't ever read it the same way again. Interesting article from Time magazine that the New Testament is Hebraic. It has a firm grounding in the Old Testament, including its worship of the one named Yahweh, whose name has also been virtually forgotten today. But these truths are coming back, and uh, we invite you to check them out, and we'll be right back. Many Bible believers today have been taught doctrines and dogmas that are not found in the Bible. Have you ever wondered where the immortal soul belief came from? If the modern church has its roots in Judaism, then why do Jews worship on Saturday and Christians on Sunday? Why and where did the change take place? Where did the holiday of Easter come from? Is it a biblically sanctioned holy day? Does it really matter if paganism crept into our modern beliefs and practices? Do all roads really lead to salvation? If you have these questions, then you need to write for the free booklet, Astonishing Bible Truths 
that your church never taught. Write to Discover the Truth, P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri 65043, or call area code 573-896-9248, or read this and many more booklets online at yrm.org. That's www.yrm.org. Welcome back. You know, if you look at the writers of the New Testament, these men were Hebrews who had a firm grounding in the Old Testament, including its worship of Yahweh. Even Paul said, I am of a Hebrew. And because of that, he looked at, at life and he looked at the situation according to the, the uh, Hebrew uh, way of looking at things through Hebraic eyes. They never intended to start a new movement, but only modify a little of what already existed in their Old Testament-based worship. Now we come to fact number two. The last thing on the Savior's mind was to abolish the laws of his father and the Bible. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he writes, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, most people at that point said, well, he came to do away with the law. In, in diametric opposition of what he had just said, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, that's the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is really called the, the yod, or one tittle, which is a decorative device on, placed on those letters, none of that will pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And he says that won't happen till heaven and earth pass. Well, I look out here and I see heaven and earth still here. So it looks like the law is still in effect. There is no wiggle room here. He went on, quote, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, do and teach the law, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. What was the problem? Well, the scribes and the Pharisees basically taught their own laws. They added to the law. He never condemned them for, for keeping the law, but for all their added rites and rituals that they added in addition to Yahweh's law. And then the Savior, Yahshua, proceeds to magnify the law. He made it even more binding. Throughout his ministry, our Savior introduced spiritual applications that render the law even more important and necessary in our lives. One of his purposes was to make man aware of deeper spiritual dimensions that the law had, brought out by the physical aspects to remind us to always keep that law. He revealed that the guiding principles he lived by must also be in our hearts. And that was the key. It was supposed to make a change in the heart. It's not something we do by ritual, by rote, and then forget. We are to remember what it's supposed to do within us. And that's the purpose of Yahweh's laws. You know, far from abolishing the law and our need to obey it, he magnified it. He made it rise to a higher level, introducing uh, man to a higher standard. In other words, he raised the bar on our obedience. He said in Matthew 5 that if you just think bad thoughts, you're breaking the law, therefore sinning. Note he did not say bad thoughts are inconsequential because there is no law. He said just the opposite. He taught the spiritual dimension of the law of his father, Yahweh, which the religious leaders of his day were completely missing. They didn't get the spiritual part of it. It never registered with them. 
They were all caught up only in the physical observance. Consider this for a minute to try to get a grasp of what I'm saying. When you obey traffic laws, you're submitting not just to a statute, but just as important, you are uh, proving a willingness to accept a societal standard that will help ensure your own survival and well-being on the road, as well as the safety of, of all other drivers on the roadway. You see, in all law, there is a higher principle operating, an important purpose behind the law, and whether I comply to it reflects directly on who I am as a person. Am I willing to sacrifice some of my own craving to, to drive fast, for instance, to ensure the safety of others on the road? Am I humble enough to submit to a restriction on my lifestyle? And do I respect the society of my peers who established the speed limit? It all comes back on who I am, the character of the person. And the same thing can be applied to the laws that Yahweh gave to all mankind. To deny a law of the Bible reveals a rebelliousness that Yahshua said has no place in the heart of his followers. To keep his father's laws shows a desire to humbly comply with the father's wishes and it reflects a love, a respect for the one we worship. So that's one of the uh, major teachings of our Savior. He didn't come to destroy the law, but to magnify it, to show its deeper meaning. Fact number three, the early New Testament believers were almost all Hebrews. In fact, the term early Jewish Christians is often used by scholars in discussing the early history of Christianity. Yahshua, his 12 apostles, his family, and essentially all of his early followers were Hebrews. The 3,000 converts on Pentecost following the death of our Savior, described in Acts chapter 2, were all Jewish proselytes to the new faith. And most significantly, this early body of believers described in the New Testament followed the teachings of what they called the scriptures, the Old Testament. Yahshua the Messiah was a Hebrew all his earthly life. He continually taught and referred to the Bible and its laws throughout his ministry. In fact, the observance of biblical law as the will of the Father is a central theme in the teachings of Yahshua and his disciples. When he was asked, by a certain man, how one can find everlasting life, he immediately enumerated five of the Ten Commandments and admonished the individual who asked him that to keep the commandments. He emphasized that without obedience, you will not be granted salvation. Hebrews 5.9 tells us that he became the author of salvation to all who obey him. In fact, we find 250 Old Testament passages and 55 New Testament verses telling us to be obedient to all commanded scripture. Again, we invite you to check it out. Get yourself a concordance and look at it. Look up the word obey and you'll be surprised what you'll find in both Old and especially in the New Testament. Well, stay tuned. We'll be right back. If you find this program informative, then our website is for you. YRM.org is packed with eye-opening information, more than we could ever put into a 30-minute program. Online, you will find dozens of studies, sermon and music downloads, and an order form for our newsletter, Bible course, free CD and DVD sermons, and dozens of free study booklets on a wide variety of topics all just a click away. And don't forget to join us online each Saturday at 1.30 Central Time for our live worship service. Type yrm.org in your internet browser and start discovering the truth today.
If you look in Revelation chapter 22, verse 14, it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Then it says, for without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loves and makes a lie. Who are these people? These are the people that don't adhere to any kind of law, any kind of standard of morality, of righteousness. They're outside, they're locked out. But those that want, that desire to enter into the gate of salvation will be obedient. You know, we need to be concerned about our Savior and, and what he said was the prerequisite for everlasting life. When Yahshua the Messiah explained how to love him and be loved of the Father, how did he say to do it? He said in John uh, 15, 10, to keep my commandments. That's how we love him. We keep his commandments. So I guess if we don't keep his commandments, it shows that we don't love him. His problem with the religious leaders of his day was in their making their own laws, not the keeping of the Father's laws. He said in Mark chapter 7, verse 8, For laying aside the commandment of Elohim, you hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such things as you do. This was the added law we talked about. And this is what became important to them. And this is what uh, basically has many people confused. He didn't come to do away with the moral spiritual law of the Bible. What he did was change all these added laws and threw them out so that we don't have to add all this ritual to our daily life and our worship as was done in his day by the religious leadership. Okay, fact number four in our look at the early believers in the New Testament is this. Believe it or not, the New Testament believers did not have an official name for themselves. You know, people like to hang labels on uh, different things. Uh, it gives them a point of reference, a way to define and uh, compartmentalize others. But strangely, you cannot find an official name for the New Testament believers. In Acts, they're simply called people of the way or, or that way. Of course, most think of the New Testament believers as Christians, but believe it or not, Christian is not a term they ever gave to themselves. In fact, the term Christian was first applied by Greek Gentiles to believers after Paul started preaching at Antioch, and that's in Acts chapter 11. Christian is a term used just twice in the New Testament, and the plural is used only once. In Acts chapter 28, I'm sorry, 26 verse 28, Herod Agrippa says mockingly to Paul, you're fast trying to make a Christian of me. So here again, we have a non-believer tacking a name onto uh, the movement that uh, he says Paul started. Agrippa used the term in sarcasm. Think about it. It was a Greek term used by Gentiles to describe a Hebraic movement led by a Hebrew Messiah. Now, ask yourself what a purely American movement give itself a Chinese name. Well, not very likely. Obviously, something has been missing in this regard for thousands of years. And as a footnote, uh, although Paul was on trial, he maneuvered the proceedings around in an effort to convert the judge, the monarch himself, Herod Agrippa. And Herod recognized this strategy that he was using. Notice the uh, common ground that uh, Paul used, his approach to try to sway Agrippa to uh, his Savior-centered faith. He says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Paul was confident this king knew the Old Testament because the ancestors of the Herods were the Idumeans, who after the Maccabean revolt were forced to adopt Judaism. And Herod Agrippa was very well aware of the teachings of the Old Testament. 
Interestingly enough, it was the Old Testament Paul was, was anchoring his arguments on. It was the Old Testament that gave credibility to Paul's ministry as it prophesied of the Messiah, Yahshua. Paul showed that the basis for New Testament belief in the Savior is none other than the Old Testament prophets. The Apostle Paul, credited by so many for establishing a New Testament faith, said it was the Old Testament that gave the New Testament its legitimacy. And this is by his own words. Notice in Acts chapter 28, uh, verse 23, notice what he actually did. When they had appointed him a day, it says, there came many to him into his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of Yahweh, persuading them concerning Yahshua, the Messiah, notice, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning until evening. Paul focused on persuading the leaders that Yahshua is the future king of the coming kingdom. He is the Messiah, and he used the Old Testament law and prophets to prove it. Paul used that approach throughout the book of Acts. He labored to prove the evangel of Yahshua the Messiah as the true and necessary fulfillment of Israel's scripture, of Old Testament history, typology, and prophecy. You know, a significant development took place in the ministry of the Apostle Paul that gives us great insight into the early nature of New Testament worship. It's about the year 50, and there developed a crisis, and Paul had to deal with it by going to consult the other leaders at Jerusalem. It developed from those who thought New Testament converts had to, adopt to Jude, adapt to Judaism, uh, Jewish customs and everything, before they could enter into the New Covenant. This is significant because it arose purely from the fact that the roots of the early assembly were Hebraic in origin. The early believers were all Jews. They already had a Hebraic background. Well, that's all the time we have for today, but uh, we, we invite you to stay tuned next time and we'll investigate more of these fascinating facts as we discover the truth.